Welcome to Layer of the Alchemist, where we discuss all things heavy metal and hard rock. And for today's episode, I was, he's back with me. We're doing part two of our favorite and least favorite from the KISS records. Part one, we did the first six plus side two of uh, a live two. And we're taking it, picking it up from there with Dynasty, taking it out to the rest of the makeup era stuff, as well as the solo albums. We're going to be picking our favorites and least favorites from there. So joining me here again is uh butch butch thank you for uh thank you for finishing this up here with us here kiss makeup era least favorite and Great. favorites pleasure to do it what are my favorite things talking about you know my favorite band you're lucky if you can get me to shut up so <laughs> well he said in part one that he, he's a kiss apologist and we're gonna see how far he takes that because uh we've got as well i've got some of these albums in here i, I mentioned in the first round i'll say it again when we say our least favorite, that doesn't mean we hate it, uh, but it could mean we hate it. And I'll let you know, we'll let you know if there's some things that we hate. And there are some songs coming up here that I really do not care for that I picked off of some of these records. So, so this is going to be a lot of fun. All right, Butch, kick us off here. We are, uh, we, the last episode, we ended with uh, the studio side of Alive 2. We are now on Dynasty. So what do you got for your favorite and least favorite from Dynasty? I had a hard time with this record because uh, I feel like even though I think he peaked with uh, Shock Me and Rocket Ride, I feel like Ace really came on strong on this record too. Like Hard Times is a great song and Save Your Love. Um, ultimately though, I went with Charisma, which is a song I've loved since, uh, you know, since I started like really getting into music heavily and then when I bought this record um I think it's one of Gene's it's an interesting song and you know it it's, fits his personality perfectly you know his whole cult of personality fame kind of thing um and uh I just like the whole vibe of that song and as much as I love the ace songs and um some of Paul's stuff on the record like um, that's the one of his two songs in this record that I love. So ultimately went with Charisma. As far as my least favorite, uh, I used to say I hate this song. I'm not sure I hate it, but I definitely don't like it. And that's Dirty Living. Like, not a good song. Um, another case of trying to keep Peter happy. The only one that he played on, on the record, too. Um, I don't know. It just is it's you know, it kind of sounds like something that was should have been on a solo record or, um, you know, and it's it's more disco than people call this a disco record. And really, other than I was made for loving you, I don't I think this is the only other song that has that disco kind of vibe to it. It just doesn't. Uh, yeah, that's not why I hate it, but it's I just don't like this song. Yeah. All right. Well, my picks are the same as you. Uh, I actually really like this record. You know, I kind of have a soft spot for for. Yeah, Dynasty. I like the record a lot. Yeah, I know it's kind of you know a lot of people consider it after their peak, but but I kind of like it. Uh, Charisma for all the reasons you said. Uh, it, it it plays to Gene's personality, the super ego of of Gene. You know, and he it just works. It just you know he he sells it really well. And Dirty Living, it's just a forgettable. You know terrible song it sounds like we're dumping on peter chris a lot of our picks for least favorite land on peter yeah. but it's just the way it is sorry <laughs> sorry yeah. peter. sorry Petey. <laughs> all right now did i screw up when did the solo albums come out did they come out before dynasty they, they came out in 78 so was that where would that have landed before dynasty or after that when did dynasty yeah it was uh between it came out between uh they uh they took a break as the band was about to break up and Ace and Peter were like going to quit the band and that's when they said, well, let's do solo records. So they filled the space with a live two and double platinum while they did the solo records. And then the solo records came out in 78, you know, the, they okay. released uh, 4 million records on the same day and right. got like 8 million returned. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, All right. All right, well, let's move yeah, on to yeah. the solo, solo albums next, and I probably should have, should have done them okay. first chronologically, but let's move to the solo albums first. Let's, let's start with our man Ace here. What's your favorite and least favorite? Um, awesome. I always go, 
it's probably my favorite of the solo records. Um, him and Paul, I think, turned in great albums. And uh, I had a hard time picking a favorite on, on Aces. Uh, I was going to do I'm in Need of Love. But really, I think my favorite is Rip It Out. Um, it's kind of a sentimental favorite. I used to, you know, I played it in a, the very first band I was in. and But I've always loved the song. Um, I like the energy to it. It's a great, like song that you know it's a great live song um so yeah uh that's my favorite and I, again i actually like every song in this record and it was hard to pick a least favorite i i went with wiped out i mean it's just that it's just the one that i like the least i it, i don't dislike it at all i i think ace's album is near perfect i was gonna go new york groove but there's something fun about that that song. I mean, Wiped Out is fun too, but I don't know. That's just of all the ones that's the most forgettable to me, even though this is still a, this is a nine or 10 star record for me. Uh, Ace like proved himself as a musician and a songwriter. Um, it didn't, you know, and it, uh, you know, it carried him through a few years and then so it was also the most successful of his solo records. So good stuff. Yeah, uh, I've always loved Ace's, Ace's solo album. To me, it proves that he's the only guy, he's the real rocker, you know, in, in the band here. And uh, his voice works, you know, on the record. His playing is really cool. He's got a great band behind him, Anton Fig on drums. Mm -hmm. uh, so my favorite is also Rip It Out, uh, the drums in it. I love that spot where the drums are doing all the fills. Yeah. And everything. You know, that's just, that's just super cool. Uh, it's just a, it's just a really cool song. It's a great album opener. And for my least favorite, I did go with New York Groove. Uh, I never liked this. It, it, it always stood out on the record, like wiped out as sort of a goofy throwaway, but this was, I don't know, it just, uh, you know, it has a slight disco-y, esh, disco-like feel to it a little bit. And I know it's a cover song, right? It's not a, uh, you know. Yeah, there was a group called Hello that um, I think Todd Rongren produced them and um, they recorded it. Um, they were like one of those, you know, 70s, early to mid 70s, like glitter rock yeah. kind of bands. And that's glitter what the rock. song sounds like. It's it's a, like, you know, like Gary Glitter. It falls in with the Gary Glitter T-Rex, like yeah that kind of that whole kind of vibe uh so i mean it's a it it kind of does you're right it does stick out a bit because the rest of the record is more hard rock stylistically and, like yeah. yeah hard rock and heavy and that song is kind of like yeah i almost wish like, interest like if it had been released just like as a one-off single or something at some point in kiss when nace was in kiss or whatever you know it, it would like a, just a fun one-off thing that he did but when it sits on the record it sort of takes away the mood i wish he had just stuck with the hard rocking vibe so yeah all right how about paul love this record um and my favorite song on it is tonight you belong to me um i just love the you know again i keep coming back to it but he's really good at writing these songs that start out you know it starts out kind of dreamlike and then it just gets heavy and um but it's super melodic and it's got great playing on it and uh i just love the i've loved this song since i first heard it it's tremendous i i saw him on he toured for his album live to win and it was really cool to get to hear him play songs from this record that he you know doesn't get to play in the confines of kiss so um that's a that's my favorite song and um, yeah, I hate this next song, Hold Me, Touch Me. I, it's bad. Um, uh, I just don't, I mean, okay. I guess he felt he needed a ballad, but it's, and it was the single and oh. it's, yeah, it's not a good song. I mean, I don't think it's a good song at all. It's way super schmaltzy compared to the rest of the record. I mean, this is a record that toggles between like a couple heavier songs and then it's got a, you know, some raspberries-esque like kind of power pop like would you like to know me and yeah you know so it's all right and and then it's got this stupid schmaltzy ballad on it's just terrible i'm i'm sure he had better ballads up his sleeve than this one so <laughs> thumbs down 
on that song. <laughs> and that's the only that's and, and when I when I compare it to Ace is that that's that I keep coming back. This is because of that I can't I can't put it above Ace's. Right? If it weren't for that stupid song, yeah. Paul's would be my favorite. Yeah. All right. Well, Paul's is my second favorite of the of the solo albums, and it sort of shows that what a good songwriter Paul is. And uh, my favorite is Wouldn't You Like to Know Me? Uh, I like Great melodic song. rock type songs. You could picture this. It reminds me a little bit of like a Russ Ballard thing. You know, it could have been Since You've Been Gone. You know, it's got like that sort of big yeah. force to it. I could picture if they never did these solo albums, Paul would have sold that song to Rick Springfield and Rick Springfield would have had a massive hit with it or, you know what I mean? It's, it's a great melodic radio rock uh, type of song. Was that a single? Did they release that as a single? No, uh, they only released one single. I think uh, I actually, I have to take back what I said about Hold Me, Touch Me, but uh, I think the only song that came out as an actual 45 was New York Groove, which was a hit. Um, there were no singles but, uh, from, from Paul's album? No, and um, it's a great song. Like if they, in another world where they don't do the yeah. solo records and they do another Kiss record, like I, I think you can get enough off these records like that they could have made another great Kiss album. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's a great, I love that song. It, it wasn't, it wasn't really on my radar back in the day when I first got it. I always liked it. But as the years have gone on, I'm like, holy crap, this song is killer it's an amazing song it's very catchy very well could have been a huge hit yeah absolutely all right and my least favorite is the same as you hold me touch me think of me when we're apart <laughs> oh man terrible just absolutely awful it sounds like some sort of dreadful air supply yacht rock uh yeah. I, I don't know man just dreadful am radio bad 70s it reminds me of everything that was the bad aspects of the 70s and this is just a good example this song you know again am radio air supply just total wimpy and his vocal delivery on it is so like it's almost comical you know you could almost picture it yeah. in some some modern day uh comedy you know and they, they play this song in the background it's like a joke you know for like a joke scene or, uh, or something and it's just it's terrible all right yeah i mean it's like it's like elevator music like yeah if, uh, where would you take it from there for the elevator i mean oh. it'd be even ultra elevator i mean because it comes out of the box he should have sold it to michael mcdonald yeah exactly it's like it's almost like, you know, the way with uh, Hard Luck Woman, he was trying to write a song that was like a Rod Stewart-like song. He was going to sell yeah. it. To, I think he even said he tried to sell it to Rod Stewart. Uh, and this sounds like something that, you know, somebody <laughs> wanted him to write a song for bread or air supply. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some, some, band, some band like this just total wimp, a track, yacht rock, you know, late 70s. Uh, type of you know band and it's just oh, it's, it's terrible it's bad all right the monster Joey. Gene, who did a very unmonster like record um probably the most disappointing out of the four because you were expecting jeans the scariest looking guy he's the demon he's the monster he's gonna definitely put something heavy out you know and yeah i mean look at the cover yeah. i mean it you know he's got that whole image and um you know i i was listening to uh you know the contrarians did an episode on what if uh kissed in another album instead of you know yeah. and they were cobbling together their their best of the what their kiss record would have looked like and yeah it's tough like someone was talking about uh how gene like just went experimental which i think is you know, I guess maybe he was getting, you know, he and Paul, like, were getting their Kiss music out in Kiss, so he does this kitchen sink kind of record that, I don't know, but it does have its moments. It's not my favorite record. I don't hate it. Um, there's parts of it that I, I think are, like, kind of, like, I could do without or, you know, but uh, there are some really cool moments on it. Like, I love, my favorite song on this record is uh, See You Tonight. Um that and Mr. Make Believe when he gets into um, full Beatles mode. Um, I love when Gene does that. Like he, you know, 
the song is just so well written. It, 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 I just love everything about that song. I love the melody. Um, I love the feel to it. Um, again, I'm a Beatles fan, and you know he's a huge Beatles fan, obviously. Um, so that song always sticks out to me. I love that they did it when they did the Unplugged thing. Um, it's a song I think should have gotten more attention. Again, a song that I think could have been, you know, it's out of character for them, but again, on a in a different world on a Kiss record, maybe would have been interesting to see how that song would have fared. Um, least favorite, it's too easy to go with When You Wish Upon a Star. And, you know, I don't take it seriously as a song on the record, I guess. You know, it's knowing Gene's history, um, his mother surviving the Holocaust, and they came here from Israel you know, penniless, he couldn't speak English. He taught himself to, you know, to speak English and, um, you know, raise himself up from nothing to become, you know, you talk about the American success story. Um, he came from nothing and made himself something. And I think it's almost appropriate that, you know, a kid who was into comics and fantasy, like picked this song, like it's kind of, it just, fitting for him so i can't i couldn't pick that one and this is a repeat song really in a way i picked uh see you in your dreams i mean it didn't work the first time why record it again like, <laughs> i i know he had other songs kicking at the time there's demos floating around from the time period uh again it's just a boring song i mean uh i just don't dig that song i don't think it works some of the other songs on the record, while not great, or like, you know, like Burning Up with Fever has like a cool, like, it's almost, if it were heavier, like you could see it, it almost falls into that almost human, larger than life, kind of like heavy groove, Gene Simmons kind of thing. But um, yeah, I got to go with Seeing Your Dreams. It, you know, it was a mistake twice in their career. <laughs> All right. Well, I just looked to see if, if, this album was just produced by Gene or if there was somebody else involved. And it does say Sean Delaney. And I was going to say that this is an album that is a good example of somebody not reining him in, you know, with so much money, so much ego, so much fame. No one could tell him that <clears throat> these are bad decisions. Uh, and the record just feels like everything misses on this record for me. I don't hate it. Uh, there's some moments here and there, like I almost went with Radioactive as my favorite because that kind of yeah, has some cool moments uh but i went with see you in your dreams this was on my b deep cuts when we did our deep cuts episode i actually like this version it 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 it, it seems like what they were trying to go for before didn't quite hit the mark here it works a little bit better maybe it's the girl background singers to give it like a motown like feel to it you know yeah. and so it just it swings a little bit more for me on here and the girl background singers and everything. I just kind of, I just kind of like it in this context better. And I know it's low hanging fruit. I feel guilty picking it now after, after <laughs> everything you just said about it, but man, oh man, when you wish upon a star, I mean, it almost sounds like, I, as I was listening to it today, I was, you know, the old Disney movies where somebody would be singing and there'd be, cartoon characters you know a bird yeah. would fly over the head and an yeah. elephant would come by blowing hearts out of its thing you know that's almost what i was picturing in my jeans singing while you know butter comic uh cartoon butterflies from disney butterflies yeah. fly around his head <laughs> or something it's just he could have done this and done it differently you know he could have like if he had just done like uh like a stripped down acoustic guitar thing exactly. with it or something you know but man the strings it's so disney that it just it is just so over the top it's 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 really it's really tough and i just don't think he has the voice for for this type of thing and it's just the wrong key for him there's a spot at the end where he goes up into his falsetto and everything and i admire him for you know gene's voice is a lot more versatile than people would probably give him give him credit for but man Definitely. Just, Mrs. DeMarc here for me. And I can just picture everybody in the studio, you know, 
trying to not laugh and he leaves the room exactly. and everybody bursts out laughing like you know just people being scared to death to, to say anything you know to him because he's you know he's he's the he's the guy but all right oh. <laughs> all right mr kiss apologist <laughs> go well <laughs> it's not it's not the as floor is yours. record <laughs> It's not as painful a record for me now as it was when I was younger. When I was younger, I was, you know, when I first got into hard rock and metal, I was hard rock and metal all the time. Like it took from like age 12 to like 17, 18, I was hard rock and metal. Um, and, you know, with some classic rock thrown in there, of course, the Beatles and, uh, you know, Devo, like some new wave and things like that but um it took a while for me to like branch out into uh other genres outside of rock and uh watching uh i was watching uh pbs uh woodstock was on and that's what it watching i turned it on as Fine family stone was coming on and that's what turned me on to r b and so over the years, I've been able to open myself up more to this record because that's where Peter's coming from. Um, he's more of a, you know, he's more of a, a jazz and R&B background guy. He, he didn't really come into the band as like a, you know, he wasn't like a John Bonham, like heavy, you know, he's not like a, a hard rocker like the rest of the guys are. He's a little bit older than them and was it the Sinatra and stuff like jazz and so that being said, it's still, it's not a great record. Um, and I'm not surprised because he's not, Peter doesn't really, what did I do there? Peter doesn't really like write songs. So I do like a few on the record though. Um, I, for a long time, I liked That's the Kind of Sugar Papa Lives because it was the closest thing to like rocking or uh, tossing and turning. Sounds, you know, Kiss even played that live. But, uh, and then I always liked I Can't Stop the Rain, but over the years I've, I've swung towards uh, Don't You Let Me Down is my, is my favorite song off the record. It's got like a, I don't know, it's got like a very slight reggae kind of vibe to it. It's very soothing and um, I just like the feel of the song. I like his voice on it. Um, I don't know. I think it's a pretty cool song actually. Uh, and then my least favorite is Hooked on Rock and Roll. I mean, that's a, it's just a terrible song. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to listen to. I actually don't mind some of the ballads on here better than when he tries to rock, like it doesn't work because when he tries to rock, he's like doing like this rock and roll bar band crap, like instead of, I don't know, maybe it's best to go to this record with no expectations of it rocking but it's not good it's not a good record and it's hard to pick favorites but i do you know it's not the worst thing i've ever heard but it's not great <laughs> all right well for me i i do not like this record at all i find nothing redeeming about it it's a perfect zero <laughs> for me it's just clueless uh and no it's not because yeah, I know. Peter talks about how he's a rhythm and blues and soul and swing guy. I really like a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, this to me just completely misses to none of this grooves or swings or none of this feels like Wilson Pickett or, you know, anything that I would consider to be really cool Motown or rhythm and blues. It comes nowhere near that. It sounds to me like just a clueless trying to do this stuff but just just missing it you know just like it's just terrible it's just a terrible terrible record i i can't listen to it, it it's so it doesn't even have any for as much as he talks about him being into this kind of swing and rhythm and right. blues stuff it doesn't have any swing or groove or feel or rocking you know rocking and rolling to it at all for me it's just it's all like his drumming, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a big Peter Chris fan in general. I never really cared for his drumming. It doesn't, 
it just doesn't work at all on here. It just completely misses it for me. Uh, I don't know what to say about it. To pick to pick a favorite, I mean, I couldn't. I just think that they're all terrible. But if you force my hand on it, I might. I, I picked Rock Me Baby, and yeah. for for one that I don't, my least favorite. I don't like any of them. I just went with that's the kind of sugar Papa likes because I can't stand <laughs> the title. The title, yeah. <laughs> it's just, and uh, it's just terrible man and it's just just like a sort of a clueless and i get like you know their solo albums you're supposed to show your personality and to show that look what's what's this thing that paul stanley did recently soul station is that what he called it yeah that's now cool to me that swings that grooves that's motown that's rhythm and blues that sounds great and i'll tell you i have a friend i know he's he's, he's older than me he used to play with the temptations and he knows i'm a metal fan and he sent me a message and uh, sent me a video of Paul Stanley. He's like, he goes, I've never heard anything by Kiss, but I, I've, I've, I've heard of Kiss. He goes, I can't believe how good this is. He was like, this is really, really cool. You know, he was like, wow, this, this sounds fantastic. And he knows I'm a metal fan, you know, yeah. and everything. And so that's why he kind of was like, whoa, I'm completely like blown away and shocked. And he's a big, he played with the Temptations. He's a big Motown rhythm and blues fan. And so to me, that's that works paul stanley sounds fantastic and it sounds real authentic this sounds like I, i'm so shocked that peter always says he's a rhythm and blues swing fan because i don't hear it at all on this record it sounds yeah. to me like a like a, a rock guy trying to do these things and he just has no clue about it, it totally misses the mark totally doesn't work it's just dreadful so let's move I on i think they should have <laughs> They should have thrown him in the studio with Parliament, who was on the same label, basically. And yeah, had maybe them, if the tracks yeah. were, that's what they should have done. Put a band behind him. Somebody else write all the songs, let him. Because he does have, you know, his voice could have worked. You know, he, he might have been better off doing more like, a, if he wanted to do more of like a bluesy thing, like Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, Rock Me Baby, you know, Rock Me Out, yeah. you know, early Jeff Beck. I think he would have worked better on that type of thing but this to me just just uh it just doesn't it's it doesn't, it's rough man yeah it's it's rough all right <clears throat> unmasked it's unmasked favorite least favorite uh i think it's an underrated record um i actually bought, accidentally bought two copies of this when i was a kid because i was in the mall with my grandmother it was near christmas and i uh convinced her to buy me a few records. Um, she bought me this one and uh, Freedom of Choice by Devo and Auto American by Blondie. And when my mom saw them, my mom was jacked. And uh, I found out the reason why is because she bought me the exact same three records for Christmas. So, uh, but, uh, you know, for me, it's a, uh, you know it's it, it kisses they're beyond hard rock at this point they've they've lost their way um peter's out of the band anton fig is on the record um they got vinnie poncia producing it again who did dynasty and i don't know i think there's a lot of good songs on it um it's kind of like a almost like a power pop record in a lot of ways although there's a couple of disco-y kind of things on it too but naked city i think is a treasure on this record i think it's one of the best songs they ever did it's one of gene's very best uh this is like a top 10 kiss song for me um you know top five gene song for sure if not you know in his top three um i just love the whole vibe to that song um and my least favorite is shandy i i just don't uh i i could have picked uh i don't know i don't really like easy as it seems that much um but shandy is like i don't know i just don't i don't think the ballad on the record uh, so those are my two yeah i did not like this record uh you know i wouldn't give it a zero but i'd probably give it like a three or four i think the production uh the guitars sound really weak on it and everything it's sort of uh whereas dynasty I don't know, it works on Dynasty for me. Here it just goes too far in whatever direction they were trying to go. And Kiss was, when you say lost, yeah, Kiss was just completely, 
out of touch with what was happening in the world. Uh, this album came out in 1980, the year that Judas Priest releases British Steel, Ozzy releases Blizzard of Oz, Black Sabbath releases Heaven and Hell, the new wave of British heavy metal is peaking, uh, and Kiss it releases Unmasked, just like they're so oblivious to what's going on in the rest of the, uh, the music world. So it, a lot of the songs on here haven't aged particularly well. Some of them are okay though, uh, but I just think the production sort of drags, it lets them, it down. drags them down. It lets it down. But uh, I went with my favorite is Is That You? I don't know. Great song. Yeah, it's kind of has a little bit of, there's a little bit of guitar heft in that one. The main riff is a little minor key, uh, dark sounding a little bit, you know, for the, when there's not a lot of that on this record. Uh, and my least favorite is Shandy. That is just absolutely cringy. Uh, the strumming guitars. I just think of the way they looked around this time in their videos and everything. Just, I just picture them doing this song and Motorhead is doing Ace of Spades and Black Sabbath yeah. is doing Heaven and Hell. And it's just like, they are so out of touch with, with what was going on in the world of heavy rock and heavy metal. It was absolutely shocking, you know, that, that they, they're still like stuck in 78 mode at this point, thinking that this kind of disco-y, not really disco, but this sort of sound, it's very like 77, 78, but I know two years doesn't sound like a lot, but in the world of heavy rock, a lot happened between 1978 and 1980 yeah. and kiss was just not on not on top of it here and it's it's embarrassing at times and shandy just does that for me it's just total cringe it's interesting though it was a huge hit in australia I know. and then yeah. and then this is the only country that i think uh i don't know how many countries they toured but this was the first time in years that it didn't tour the united states for a record yeah um they played one show and that was at the Palladium in New York when Eric Carr to introduce him. And other than that, no unmasked uh, because the album flopped. I mean, it went gold, but I mean, that was on, you know, you figure that's first day, first yeah. week kind of strength of name yeah. alone. But it's interesting, though, that a song like that was like, you know, that when they're like losing popularity here, that somewhere else in the world would pick up on them. So who knows? Who go figure. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, the elder. Here's 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 another one that. Uh, how bad? I mean, how bad do you feel for Eric Carr? He he joins like a band that was one of the biggest hard rock bands in the world. He gets in the band. He's a hard hitting, bottom s kind of drummer, and they're like, "Hey, we're gonna do a concept record, and it's gonna be with Bob Ezrin, and we're gonna do our Pink Floyd record because." We want to be appreciated now by the critics, right? Instead of like going to a, like a, you know, a hard rock kind of thing, which is what they should have done. Like you said, I mean, look at what's happening in hard rock at the time and metal. Like instead, they're like so lost again at this point where they're like, well, we need to please the critics, you know, instead of thinking about, no, you need to get back to doing what you did. Yeah, and get back to basics. This is this is the they, point in Kiss's career where they they are they are behind on all the trends. By the time Creatures of the Night comes out in what eighty two, Creatures of the Night, yeah, they're two years too late. You know, Creatures of the Night should have came out in nineteen eighty, and it would have lined up with Back in Black and all those other records. Instead, they're two years behind. Uh, they're by the time they start wearing spandex and all that stuff, it's the late eighties hair metal is already starting to, you know, they're late to the hair metal party, uh, right. the nineties, they were way late to the grunge party, you know, and it's just from this point on, it just feels like that they're trying to, to sometimes it works, but they're never really, they're just sort of chasing things, but they're always like. X number of years, years behind, you know, whatever the, the yeah. most recent trend is. For sure. And Elder is a record that, I don't know. I mean, those guys won't even, I don't, they won't even defend it as 
I haven't even seen them defend it as a good record. They always say it's a, you know, not only is it, you know, it's definitely not a good Kiss record. Um, but uh, I still have a soft spot for it. Um, and a lot of it, it over the years, it's actually grown. Like there is actually like a cult following for this record yeah. that people that, and you know, if I go through it song for song, like it, it uh, maybe it's a nostalgia thing for me when I came in on this record after they got popular again in the early, you know, around 83. Yeah. Um, I got into them again around 82 with the creatures. Um, and I bought this on cassette and, uh, so, you know, it's not a go-to record for me. Um, I don't love it. I do think it's not, wasn't smart for them to make it. Um, it is what it is though. Um, but the oath is heavy as hell. And if they would have gone in that direction, I don't know what might have happened for them. Maybe if they made a concept record and instead, but made it heavy mm -hmm. instead of like so theatrical and over the top. I mean, I love some of these mellow songs. Like I, I love Under the Rose. Um, I do think A World Without Heroes is a great ballad. Um, I even like there's parts of Odyssey I really like. Um, the melody during the uh, during the verses and um, but I mean ultimately as a as a record it, it's not a go to for me. Uh, I do appreciate it. I do have it. I have all of them. Uh, it's not their worst record. I don't think uh, my least favorite song on it is Dark Light. Uh, I was between that and Mr. Blackwell for me, and I listened to them both. And I don't know as big an Ace fan as I am, I. There's just something about that song. I, I think he was, I think Ace was. Checked out by them. Checked out by then. I mean, the band was, you know, he was working on stuff in his home studio and coming up with, you know, heavier material. The band was like, nah, we're not, you know, we're not going to use that stuff. And I guess he, he says he had all kinds of stuff recorded that they just cut from the, from the record, like that would have made it heavier or whatever. So, um, but that song's just kind of like throwaway. It's like token ace. I mean, it's it's okay. I don't hate it, but it's not it's not my favorite song on the album. Okay, uh, I don't particularly like this record either. Although I do like it better than Unmasked because at least they're trying to do like some different things, you know, experiment experimenting. You know, I mean, it, it totally misses the mark. And as much as I love Bob Ezrin, you know, story goes, he was deep into his drug addiction. Out of his point. mind. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff just doesn't just doesn't work. But the oath is is awesome. That's my favorite on this. It's, that chugging riff is really cool. Uh, just a great metal song. Could have you could have pictured it on Creatures of the Night. And my least favorite is Just a Boy. I cannot handle. Uh, when Paul goes into that spot up in the high, he's just a boy. Just I a boy. am just a boy. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's like, isn't that like lifted? Like, right? Isn't there a line like that in Tommy? I think a very similar. I don't know. It's just sounds so goofy and so ridiculous. It's, uh, it's just bad. But uh, it's kind of an interesting it's record to sort of listen to. I'd rather have them. To me, my problem with Unmasked is like they're trying to like, it's cliched and they're trying to like make a radio some pop record or something. And it's just, right. at least here, they're sort of experimenting and they're trying to do some different things. I mean, it doesn't work most of the time, but I'll take that over just somebody trying to get a hit that can land on AM radio, so. Right. All right, we're at the last uh, makeup era, and we are here with Creatures, Creatures of the Night. Kiss uh, gets back to the heaviness here. What's your favorite and least favorite on this? This record is super important to me. Um, it, uh, it came out at a time when I was just really, I mean, you know, I like Kiss as a kid, but, you know, it's it was around... 82 when I really started getting into music, hard rock and metal in particular. And this was one of those first records that really launched me towards heavy, heavy stuff. Um, 
I don't know how many times I played this record. I did pull out my um, my record recently uh, to check it out. There, you know, there's definitely a lot of groove wear on it. It got a lot of plays in my house. Uh, I rank this album in my top five easily. Uh, it uh, it's one of those records, like you said. I think it came. It was almost too little, too late as far as the makeup era went. Um, time shows us that taking the makeup off and doing Lick It Up like helped save their career. And uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, the album, although it didn't do great at the time, it did eventually go gold. And again, for years, they were playing about half this record in concert. A lot of these songs were staples i love it loud creatures of the night i still love you you know paul sounded amazing on that war yeah. machine is still in the in the set so this is a record that the fan base um loves pretty much um and fan bases from both you know 70s and 80s eras i think a, a lot of them like this record um i my favorite on it i i would have gone with creatures of the night but we're, honestly my favorite song on this record is danger um, it's a really underrated song. I think it's one of Paul's best from that time period. Um, I just like the the vibe of it. It's you know it's fast and it's aggressive and um, I just I love the the uh, the pre chorus to it is tr tremendous. I love the the melody line there. Um, if I have a least favorite on the record, it's Killer. Um, I like the song. It's just the one that it's kind of like the most ham fisted really on the record. Um, it's cool and all. It's just like one of those Gene kind of like, yeah, this song's pretty good. It's Gene trying to do metal. and But, uh, you know, the whole album is so strong. It's, it's really hard to pick one that I don't like. I mean, but uh, that's the one I probably go with the least. It was between that and Rock and Roll Hell for me. But again, I like them both. Yeah, I really like this record. And I think if they had uh, put this out in 80 and not done The Elder and Unmasked, I think they could have kept the makeup on for longer. I think they would have been right there with the NWO, BHM, Peep Crowd, and uh, all those other great albums that were released in 1980. It would have been a fresh kind of start for them. People would have been, okay, you know, Dynasty, slight misstep, uh, but people would have been okay with it. I think they would have retained more of the fans from the 70s. I remember sort of, you know, I mean, I was young at the time, but I, I had drifted away from Kiss already, even though I was only like 11 years old, 10 years old, because in 1980, I was listening to Back in Black and I was discovering Black Sabbath and all right. those things. And uh, but when I heard this, it was like, yeah, you know, I, I always love this record. The drumming on it is fantastic. The drum sound is Dude. great. Uh, and the overall Phenomenal. mix of it is just really cool. You know, it's, it's, it's one of their more metal records. If you were to try to say what's the most metal, heavy metal record that Kiss has ever done, you can make an argument, you know, for this one, because it does have a lot of the production and the chugging and everything chugging wrists and stuff like that. But uh, I went with uh, the title track for my favorite Creatures of the Night. I think it's just a great- Killer song. Yeah, killer song, uh, heavy, love it. And my least favorite is the same as you, uh, Killer. It's just kind of, uh, you know, compared to everything else, it just feels a little throwaway. Uh, doesn't jump out at you. It's just a little, yeah. kind of, just kind of there, you know, but again, it's, it's, it's a really strong record, so. Okay, there you go. There's our favorite and our least favorites from uh, the uh, second half of the makeup era from Kiss. Uh, I'd like to thank Butch for joining me here again at The Lair. And I know- Thanks, that, man. Yep, absolutely. You're welcome here anytime. We've got to get you back here. I know we're going to work on some other topics, get you back here. I will do uh, it. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Everybody out there, you let us know what you thought of our picks. Let us know what your picks for your favorites and least favorites. I know when we do these things, Sometimes people don't know what to put in the comments. You can just do like your first one is your favorite. Your second one is your least favorite. Or you could just put like a plus and a minus 
I've seen people doing that, you know, or, uh, you know, whatever little shorthand thing you might want to come up with. So uh, let us know in the comments down below. Uh, make sure you hit like and subscribe. And until we see you again, make sure you stay heavy, stay metal. Yeah.